Our gospel reading this morning is from Mark, the sixth chapter, verses 14 through 29. And I invite you to listen for the word. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some were saying, John the baptizer has been raised from the dead, and for this reason these powers are at work in him. But others said it is Elijah. And others said, it is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men who arrested John, bound him, and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man and he protected him. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod on his birthday gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. When his daughter Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, ask me for whatever you wish and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, whatever you ask me, I will give you even half of my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, what should I ask for? She replied, the head of John the Baptist. Immediately she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was deeply grieved, yet out of regard for his oaths and for his guests, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately, the king sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison, brought his head on a platter, and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This coming Saturday marks a one-year anniversary. Last year, on July 17th, John Lewis died. Upon his death, a certain phrase that he used, had used, became part of the main stream. Good trouble. Lewis first used this term in 2019 at the opening of an exhibit on Rosa Parks. In his speech there, he said that Rosa Parks inspired him to get in the way, to get in trouble, good trouble, necessary trouble. He would use that phrase just a few months before his death, speaking on the observance of the 55th anniversary of the march across the bridge in Selma, Alabama, where he encouraged listeners to get in good trouble, necessary trouble. Another word for good trouble is the gospel. The gospel is not always good news for everyone. The gospel, particularly Mark's gospel, is about trouble. It starts with trouble, with the rabble-rousing ministry of John the Baptist. And through all 16 chapters, what we see is the good trouble that happens with the inbreaking of the kingdom of God that disrupts threatens, weakens, and sometimes, yes, even topples the other powers at play in the world. The good trouble of the gospel shakes up the status quo. It tears down the unjust systems that kept the people oppressed. It 
speaks into dark corners and reveals what those in power seek to hide. And in including the story of John the Baptist's death, Mark participates in that good trouble. This story was not included as a side note, even though that's the way we often treat it, as this little interruption that happens. Mark has a style that includes sandwiching one story inside of another. The most recent example of this was a few weeks past when we read the story of Jairus' daughter that includes the story of the woman with the hemorrhage. So we get the beginning part about Jairus coming to see Jesus and Jesus going with him. Then all of a sudden we get the story about the woman with the hemorrhage and after that we go back to the story about Jairus' daughter. Sandwich. This is not random stream of consciousness writing or lack of focus on Mark's part. He does so deliberately. And he does it deliberately with this story as well. Because the story of John the Baptist's death interrupts, if you will, the story of the sending out of the twelve disciples. Jesus sends them out with nothing and they, and they go. And what do they do? The first thing they do is they proclaim that all should repent. Who started that message in John's gospel? Excuse me, Mark's gospel. I just gave you the answer. Okay. John. John started that. John, the messenger, who according to Mark fulfills the prophecy of Isaiah of the one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. John begins the good news with the call to repentance and the baptism for forgiveness of sins. John stirs up trouble. And that trouble continues even after he's arrested because that is when Jesus picks up the call. And then Jesus sends his disciples out to do the same thing. And this proclamation that the kingdom of God is at hand, this forgiveness of sins and healings and casting out of demons is good trouble, necessary trouble. And word that it is continuing gets back to Herod. Mark reports that John was arrested in, in chapter 1. But it is not until now, in chapter 6, that Mark gets around to telling us why. John was speaking out against Herod's marriage to his sister-in-law. According to Leviticus, this was wrong. It was sinful for a man to uncover his brother's wife's nakedness. There are also some accounts that Herod and Herodias had engaged in an affair before his brother's death, so there might have been more to the scandal than Mark reveals. And while it doesn't seem scandalous to us for a brother and sister-in-law to marry, in the ancient world, when you married into a family, you became part of the family, biologically speaking. The relationship between Herod and Herodias would have been considered incestuous. And in the Hebrew culture, such acts were forbidden. Those belonged to foreign cultures, foreign practices, foreign religions. So every time John spoke out against it, he was reminding people that Herod and Herodias did not truly belong. And they didn't. They were placed on the throne by Rome. And they had converted, if you will, to Judaism. Herodias would have been angry, not necessarily out of a sense of shame, but because John was a constant reminder that their status and their claim to the throne of David was shaky at best. She wants him silenced. Herod doesn't like John either. He doesn't want troublemakers in his kingdom. 
He doesn't like what John is saying any more than Herodias does, but he knows that John is a prophet. And the last thing he wants to do is make him into a martyr. So he has him arrested and kept in prison. And we're told that he would go to where John was kept because he liked to listen to him. And all of that makes it sound like Herod was a, a benevolent captor, a reluctant captor. But the actions to come reveal something very different. Herod may have liked to go and listen to John because it made him feel powerful. He could stand outside the prison bars listening to John's roars, knowing he was perfectly safe. John couldn't touch him. John couldn't harm him. He was locked away where no one could hear him, and Herod might have planned to just keep John there until the next diversion came along and everybody forgot about him. That may have been the plan. But then a party happened. Herod throws this party, this big banquet for his birthday. But this party is not just an excuse to gather with close friends. No, no, that's not what this kind of party is. This one's thrown for very specific reasons. Look at the guest list. Government officials, military leaders, and captains of industry are the ones invited to this party. This party was given to highlight, celebrate, glory in the power and royal status the family holds. It's an elaborate feast designed to send a very clear message. Herod is the one in control. And it's this arrogance on Herod's part that comes back to haunt him. Herodias' young daughter takes part in the entertainment for the evening, and her dancing so pleases Herod that he calls her over. In front of all those assembled, he promises to give her whatever she asks for, no matter what it is, even half of his kingdom. It's another power play on Herod's part. He's saying, it's all mine to do with what I want. And... Honestly, he probably expects that she's going to ask for something simple, like a pony. She doesn't know what to ask for, and so she turns to her mother. Herodias seizes the moment, an opportunity to permanently silence John and strengthen her own position within the court. She tells her daughter to ask for the head of John the Baptist. Herod finds himself caught in a vicious net of honor and shame. Because of his own foolish, impulsive act of bestowing honor on Herodias by virtue of her daughter, Herod is now trapped into choosing between two shameful acts. Oaths were not to be taken lightly in the ancient world. If he chose to rescind on his oath, he would actually weaken his status and his power in front of all those rich and powerful people. If he grants her wish, then he is committing murder. There's been no trial. John has not been convicted of anything, much less something that would call for his execution. Either way that Herod chooses, he's in trouble. And Herod does not have the moral courage to do the right thing. He publicly grants her request, calls for the immediate beheading of John, and John's severed head is grandly brought into the room on a platter so all can see it. John's head becomes the last course of the feast. In telling the story, Mark reveals just who these people really are and the extent to which they will go to keep their place in the world. So it is no wonder that Herod turned pale 
when he heard that a new prophet named Jesus was stirring up the same kind of trouble. He believed it must be John come back from the grave. That's the good news of the gospel. No matter how often the powers that be try to silence it, they cannot. John's arrest and murder did not silence it. Jesus' arrest and murder will not silence it. The gospel message just keeps showing up. Because once God's kingdom broke into this world, there was nothing and is nothing that will stop it. That's the good news of the gospel and why it continues to cause trouble in the world. As I said at the beginning, the gospel message is good news, but not always for everyone. The message of God's grace and mercy being extended to all, the call for people to live into the second of the great commandments, to love one's neighbor as oneself, the call to continue to reach out to those deemed less than human by those in power, to feed the hungry, to shelter the homeless, to care for the sick and the imprisoned. All of that is trouble in this world, but it is good trouble, necessary trouble. It's the trouble that Jesus and his followers will cause, and they will deal with the consequences of doing so. Can we? The last thing we want to do is cause trouble, even good trouble. We can be like Herod. Caught in a moment of making decisions on what we will do, who we will follow, what promises we will honor. And too often I fear that we too lack the moral courage to do what is right. We don't want to cause trouble. We don't want to make waves. We're so afraid of losing the power we think we have that we would rather save face and end up honoring the wrong things. That's why Mark pauses in his story about the disciples to tell us this story. He wants to remind us that following Christ means causing trouble, serious trouble, good trouble. It may no longer cost us our physical lives, but it will cost us something. Discipleship will always cost us something. The good news will always discomfort the comfortable. And Mark, Mark's just never going to let us be comfortable. To rest on our theological laurels or in our faith achievements, Mark demands a constant state of re-questioning, re-evaluating, re-wondering. In other words, we are always and immediately thrust into the next gospel moment that asks us just what it is at the heart of our faith. What do we really believe? What do we really honor? Who do we really follow? Our answer to those questions may cause trouble. But the good news is that when we engage with the one who sends us into the world with the same mission as the original twelve, we are participating in the inbreaking of God's kingdom here and now. It still breaks in. Herod couldn't silence it by killing John. Pilate couldn't stop it by killing Jesus. The Roman Empire couldn't silence it by silencing Paul and Peter and others. And the voices today that try to silence it by twisting the words to bolster their own status and power both outside and inside the church cannot stop it. It continues on. For there are those who are always 
willing. It continues on, for there are always those agents of God willing to accept the consequences and cause good trouble. Amen.